Okay, railroads were the first big business, so we're going to concentrate on railroads for a while. <coughs> um, with railroads, you have a, a double situation, so to speak. Uh, you have a double situation. It's true in, in general, but this is particularly true in railroads, which is the first large-scale industry. Mainly, you have a fantastic progressive uh, increase in standard of living, a fall in transportation costs and all that. And along with it, you have the government stepping in very heavily to subsidization and later regulation and messing things up. So you have a, a double effect here. In other words, you have two things happening in a railroad situation. One is a tremendous competitive a cheapening of costs, a competitive uh, improvement of standard of living, an increase of competition. On the other hand, uh, tremendous subsidies on the part of the government, plus later on attempts at merger and finally railroad regulation. <coughs> And um, we'll see why railroad re regulation came in later. The, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, Lincoln administration was a heavily railroad-oriented administration, and one of the first things they were committed to was a huge subsidization program to the new transcontinental railroads, which they proposed to build across the across the West. <coughs> Um, the subsidization, of, first of all, in a, in a homesteading system, which I already mentioned, with a libertarian proposal, um, what you have is uh, 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 the right of way is granted. In other words, if somebody wants to build a railroad across a, a thousand miles of nothing, the property it would get in a homesteading uh, in a homesteading law kind of setup would be whatever it, you know whatever it uses. In other words, it's right of way. To put it, it would then own the right of way. <coughs> so it means the tracks, the uh, you know the bed in which the track the track is embedded in stuff, and the and the station terminals and you know whatever. So essentially the shoulder, essentially a few feet in each side of the track. That's, that would basically be what the railroad would own in a libertarian free market setup, <coughs> a homesteading setup. And some railroads were indeed built that way. As a matter of fact, we'll see, one great transcontinental railroad was built in a purely free market thing, and it didn't, did, not, did not go bankrupt like almost all the others did. And it competed very well with the rest of it. It's called the Great Northern, and that comes a little bit later. <coughs> but at any rate, the, uh, this is not the way it was done. What the Republicans wanted was a very heavy, heavy subsidization and privileging to the railroads. And so instead of just giving them the right of way, they gave the railroads, um, first of all, first of all, they gave them, as we'll see in more detail later, as we go along, they gave them a huge amount of loans, uh, interest, basically interest-free loans, uh, heavy, heavy subsidies per mile of track uh, and, and cash, plus huge amount of, of land, and 20 miles, every mile, all the 20 mile sections, 20 square mile sections, which would mean something like you know, four and a half miles, whatever, about four and a half miles in each. But in the sections, so it means you can't do very much in here. Uh, in addition to that, the government, this is, this is bad enough, and that's this huge subsidy here. Also, of course, this becomes the most, first of all, they, they gave the railroads the best land uh, in the West. Second of all, in addition to giving them all this land, they closed, the government, U.S. government closed for settlement all land on each side up to about 60, sometimes 100 miles. Closed off. There was nobody was allowed to settle. To 100 miles on either side of the track. So in other words, obviously everybody wants to get to the railroad station because that's the, you know, there's not much going on on the west here except the railroad. And the rest is, is Indian country or whatever, or barren. So this becomes the choicest land. The government closed off for settlement, didn't allow anybody to settle any place, any place except buying land from the railroads. In other words, the railroads get this, this free land from the government and then resell it to the settlers at a high price, uh, essentially a monopoly price, so to speak. Especially because the government kept out of circul out of out of out of uh, settlement for many years. Everything on each side for, for many miles, for 80 miles or so on each side of the, of the railroad. <coughs> Fantastic subsidization. <coughs> um, and this, because of this, an enormous amount of cookery also take place, took place. In addition to this 
the boodle, was well, also called the robber barons came in. The robber barons were really the, the, the robbery was came about because it was it was an open channel by the federal government. And we'll see how we'll see how that was done. <clears throat> uh, the amount of the there's, there's differences of you know, whoever whichever place you go to to get the data. How many millions of miles of acre, acreage was handed out by the federal government to the railroads? It, I guess it depends on which some of it was given back and some. It was around it was around 220 million acres, enormous amount. Especially considering, and they say, no, the other land wasn't worth much, and, the, and a huge amount, much more than that, was kept out of out of circulation for many years, forcing people if they want to get on this on this thing to. To settle to buy land at a high price from the railroad. As a result of this and other things, we'll see as we go along. The farmers begin to set up, begin to start griping about the railroads. And the thing is, the the later gripes are more, more much more irrational. Later gripes, the freight rates are too high, which they obviously weren't, and they were falling all the time. But the the basic gripes came about in the by the 1870s, by the late early, late 1860s, early 1870s, this so-called anti-monopoly movement among the Western farmers. Well, they had a very good grievances. They had the oldest land was being kept out of circulation. Railroad had this free gift of land, and the oldest land was held out of circulation. And this land was untaxed by the local government. So he had set up a local government. The, the, the railroad land was tax exempt, even while being held out of circulation. So naturally, the uh, I don't blame the farmers for griping. I'd be griping too. So it wasn't a socialistic or status type of, type of gripe, the anti-monopoly movement. It was really essentially an attack on. The railroad privileges. Um, basically, there were four big transcontinental railroads which got the big bulk of the subsidies and the, the grants and the, the loans. Uh, if we get a, <clears throat> it's really three if you get, if you look at it, uh, this, one of them was in two halves. Uh, I'm not exactly a distinguished cartographer, but I'll do my best here. All right, something like that. Anyway, um, the two the, the two big grants at the beginning. The first big grant was the Union Pacific, which started, I believe, in Omaha, Nebraska, and it went west. And then the Central Pacific, which started from San Francisco, and went east to join it. Now this is the UPCP. Um, this is the famous Golden Spike, I think it was 1869, where they met in Utah, <clears throat> and uh, and they they drove the Golden Spike, symbolized whatever. So this is very heavily subsidized, the Union Pacific, Central Pacific. <clears throat> we'll see. Um, the north and there's the Northern Pacific, which begins around you know, west of Chicago, I think, which is Iowa around there, and it goes. To Portland, another very heavily subsidized. This got this got about 44 million acres plus a lot of sub, a lot of money subsidy. Uh, 44 million acres. All of these, I think, went bankrupt not too long. This, you know, was the, the big land grant boom was making. Union Pacific got its big first big grant in 1862. The others a few years later, and the whole thing kind of collapsed by 1872. So it was. Actually, in the Panic of 1873, most of them went bankrupt. So it was about 10 years of fantastic boom. And uh, so the separate, well, let's see, there's uh, the, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I'm, I didn't, I uh, should have looked at the map, somewhere near Chicago, somewhere west of Chicago. <coughs> yeah. Huh? Well, the use is to, to give the railroads a fantastic increase in price. In other words, if you'd like to settle somewhere here, you can't do it because it's kept out of use by the government. The government, remember, owns all the land automatically, okay? It means you have to go to the railroad land and buy it for a very high price. This benefits the railroads, an extra privilege for the railroads. The railroads are getting. Subsidies about three ways. They're getting a, a big land grant, they're get, then getting land taken out of circulation. So they have to go to the settlers, have to settle on railroad land, buy the land at a high price in railroads, instead of going here for nothing, really. Okay. And um, so it's part of the monopoly situation. Plus, they got a huge amount of loans per per line of mile of track. You know, financial, I mean, outright cash loans or, or grants or amount to. 
So these were the two big transcontinental element ones. And then there was Southern Pacific, which starts in Los Angeles and, uh, and continues something somewhere in Texas. That wasn't you know, sort of transcontinental, I guess. Okay, so this is... Uh, Northern Pacific got the most amount of land. It got 44 million acres. And uh, I think the other three got 44 million. Of course, this is about half each. So that's so the, all these three together got about 44 million. So about 88 million just for those the big four, so to speak. I shouldn't call them the big four. The big four is also named the Central Pacific leadership. At any rate, those, those, those big four uh, transcontinental railroads. The Central, this is originally Central Pacific. Very soon, Central Pacific merges with Southern Pacific and takes it, and basically takes it over under the name Southern Pacific. I mean, you've seen guys, these guys are running it. This becomes Southern Pacific, the whole California thing, a little bit later. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the Union Pacific, and one inter interesting phenomenon here, which I only found out about a couple of years ago, I was reading more about this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I can get this. Well, anyway, General General well, Grenville Dodge was the main entrepreneur of Union Pacific, and uh, as soon as the Civil War starts, he gets himself appointed a general in the American Army, Northern Army, of course. And he takes a whole bunch of troops, federal troops, takes it out of the war, and uses the troops to do what? Uses the, they knew what the route was going to be, of course. All the insiders knew. Well, another, by the way, it's another thing they did is the insiders, the top entrepreneurs and, and president, vice president, etc., knew what the route would be. They often bought land along the way and then sold it to the railroad at a very high price. <laughs> All right. The uh, <laughs> anyway, the um, general general Dodge takes a whole bunch of soldiers and uses a huge army and uses it to destroy all the Indians en route. It was just genocidal massacre of the Indians in order to clear the route for his own goddamn railroad, which would be, which <laughs> should be granted to him in 1862. That was his, his army function. I think it's an interesting example of the use of the army as a... What, is, what does it mean? It means, you see, one of the things you have to realize about business and government, the use of, is the use of businessmen Use of government by businessmen to socialize costs. In other words, to take their costs and impose them, because nobody wants to spend, pay out costs. To take the costs and impose them on the taxpayer, or it amounts to. So you use the army. What the hell? They take the army, they're conscripts anyway. Use them to kill only Indians en route, so as to clear the path for Union Pacific. Then, if, then as soon as he he clears the path, he gets out of the army and becomes the, the head of General uh, of, Union, of, Pac of Union Pacific. Isn't it? <clears throat> um, another thing these guys did, I'll, I'll give you some examples as we go along. All the con everybody was on the take. I mean, all the, all the congressmen were on the take. The, the, uh, there, was, there was a Union Pacific group in, con in Congress uh, headed, I think, I think it was Union Pacific. Let me just make sure it's more than... Uh, yeah, Union Pacific group was headed by Congressman Oaks Ames of, of uh, Massachusetts. And uh, he was the, the leader of what was known as the Union Pacific Faction. And what they did is they, everybody was on the take. Uh, when Grant comes in in 60, 1864, 1860, yeah. Um, <coughs> I guess 68. When Grant comes in 68, his whole his entire administration was on the take. His vice president, his personal secretary, his vice president, his uh, the, the head of the Senate, the head of the House, the whole gang was on the take. I mean, literally on the take from both the Pacific and, and Northern Pacific. Grant himself was not on the take. Grant himself was drunk most of the time, and he didn't know what was going on. I mean, you could say he was honest, but <laughs> he, was, he was scared one way or the other. Everybody else was on the take, and the whole. The whole gang was in, involved with this thing, and they would get what they would get is this: not only would they get actual money and cash from the railroads, both in both uh, in, all, in three cases: the Central Pacific, Union Pacific, Northern Pacific. The top managers would form construction companies, their own construction. In other words, the railroads were a big business; they had a huge amount of stockholders and a huge amount of bondholders. It was a big, 
corporate, the only really big corporation. Now, most of the uh, banks invested about 10% of the stock. Uh, others were, the rest of it was, was private investors. Many of them were English. <clears throat> also, you know, a lot of small investors because it, it was on the stock market. There was no stocks, no manufacturing companies were on the stock market yet. They were all private partnerships. They weren't big enough to have corporations. But railroads were big enough now to be incorporated. So you had a huge number of stockholders. The inside managers not only had a lot of stock, but they also had, they, they formed their own construction companies. Uh, one of them, I think, was Central Pacific. It's called the Credit Mobilier. <coughs> Other than one of them, I'll get to that specific in a minute. Uh, so each, they formed these construction companies, which were formed by the, the only stockholders of these construction companies were the top, the top stockholders of the, of the railroads. They then, they went into the construction business. They built the railroads and sold the railroads then to the, to the railroads. In other words, the Central Pacific, <coughs> the Union Pacific Construction Company, Constructed the railroad with huge, by the way, huge grants of money, subsidies from the government, uh, being per mile of, of, in many cases, of, of track. And then they sell it to the, to the railroad. They sell it at a very high price. Uh, the estimates are that about the, the, the price is about double what they would have been charged in the free market. In other words, double the cost, you know, basic price in the free market. So it's essentially, the, these guys fleece their own stockholders and, and bondholders, <coughs> essentially robbing the, yeah. With government, based on government subsidies, too. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Not the not all the owners, the top owners, the few insiders. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The, the <laughs> situation is, but let's say, I, let's say you want to form a big corporation. Okay, you're you're a two percent shareholder. You and two other buddies. Then you form another corporation, you're the president. You then hire another corporation headed by yourself and, and buddy, and your buddies, which, are, which have 100% of the share, to sell all the equipment. You sell at a very high price, and essentially you're fleecing your other shareholders. What, what amounts to is robbery of the other shareholders by the, in, the few insiders. Uh, it was, of course, illegal then, but nobody, there was no prosecution because the government was in on this, <laughs> in on this stuff. So uh, as a result, you have very, you know, very low profit rates of the railroad and, and eventual bankruptcy as well as much of this. Huge amount of profits by the construction companies. Or, yeah, they were coining it. Their capital was given to them by the, by the taxpayer in most cases. And then they were getting, then they'd sell it to, uh, double the, the value to their, to their own railroad. <clears throat> well, that was part of it, sure. I mean, the fact it was overbuilt, heavy subsidies. Yeah, that was p part of the cause was this hard to say mismanagement. They didn't care about management. They just wanted to milk the whole situation. <clears throat> I'll give you some examples of all this. I'm just going to give you an overall picture. <clears throat> yeah, Union Pacific was a credit mobilier scandal. Um, the, um, let's see, I'll get the, give you some examples here. The, um, for example, both for Union Pacific and Central Pacific, um, they got special federal government loans, 30-year bonds. They were paid by uh, in the Union Pacific case of the Central Credit Mobilier. Central Pacific, it was the Credit Finance Corporation, it was called. Okay. Uh, Credit Mobilier and the Credit Finance Corporation. And um, <clears throat> the um, So say that and this finance the construct railroad construction uh, and what happened by the way is the congressmen what they got was not just cash the congressmen the senators and the vice president and all that they got shares free shares not on the railroad but on the construction company <laughs> that was the in other words they got the senators and the congressmen and the vice president they got free you know thousand free shares of credit mobilia but how will the railroad they, the railroad is not going to take it in the chin and all this uh, <clears throat> So, um, notice it was a robber baron error, but it was a robbery only really facilitated and permitted by the fact that there were these huge, huge government subsidies, and the whole thing was tied in together. Um, for example, the Credit and Finance Corporation, which was the, the Central Pacific's construction company, got, they sold the, um, they sold the, the, the constructed railroad for $79 million to the Central Pacific. It was really only worth 
the free market was worth, say, 36 million. So it was more than double. The 79 million one was owned by the top four people who ran the, who the main owners of Central Pacific. They were the sole owners of, of the construction company, which was the actual Central Pacific. They had a lot of, of course, shareholders and bondholders. So that was the, that was the way it was done. <coughs> um, in the case of Union Pacific, the credit mobilier, the costs were, or the, the normal cost, the normal value was 44 million, and they sold it to the Union Pacific for 90, 94 million. Again, more than double, slightly more than double. <coughs> Again, it was the, the top people owned it, plus, of course, the congressmen and the senators. Get there, that little. So, um, now, by the way, Oaks Ames, I should mention about Oaks Ames, the Union Pacific cheerleader in the... What was his shtick, in addition to being on the take? He had a special interest in the Union Pacific. He was a shovel manufacturer in real life. This is what I meant the first time I told him. It's important to know what these guys do in the real world, in addition to being congressmen. He manufactured shovels. Who, gets, who do you think got the shovel contract for the construction company to build Union Pacific? One guess. <laughs> okay. It was Oaks Ames. He's getting... He's selling shovels at, again, at a handsome price to uh, Union Pacific, for which he got the contract. <clears throat> so he, he um, so the Union Pacific had on the, on the take, all right, uh, distributing stock of the Credit Mobilier, okay, the construction company. The vice president, the vice president-elect, the Democratic House leader, Speaker of the House, James Blaine, who was, was called one of the, he ran for president one year, he was called a continental liar from the state of Maine. James Garfield, senator from Ohio, uh, later, later to be president. <clears throat> Another very interesting character we'll deal with a little bit later called Pig Iron Kelly. He was a congressman from Pittsburgh area, William D. Kelly. He was known as Pig Iron because he was blatantly and obviously the representative in Congress of the Pig Iron interests. Of course, iron and steel were the big companies are in the Pittsburgh area, always calling for tariffs and all, all sorts of other subsidies for, for pig iron. <clears throat> um, the, um, well, the way Ames put it, I like the way he put it, by the way, Oaks Ames, and he's explaining why he gave a lot of, gave a lot of free shares of, of, of top credit mobility stock to congressmen. He said, quote, we want more friends in this Congress. There's no difficulty in getting, in getting them to look after their own property. I like that. That's kind of an <laughs> interesting way of putting it. <laughs> of course, taxpayer, um, taxpayer is suffering from this, and of course, the other railroad men. The, um, the Northern Pacific, uh, well, oh, I should, first of all, I should talk about the Central Pacific. Central Pacific is interesting, another interesting group. It was run, Union Pacific, let's say, was, was Oaks, Oaks Ames and the uh, Grenville Dodge. The Central Pacific, which hooked up with it from San Francisco, was run by the so-called Big Four, which had the, which were the sole owners of a construction corporation. Okay. Interesting characters. The, the, um, the families of the Big Four, the four people, are still dominant in California even to this day, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the Big Four Tet was uh, Charles Crocker, who was the he was the contractor. All over California, there's still the Crocker Bank everywhere. <clears throat> the same family. Um, Carlos Huntington was sort of a dominant guy. Huntington. The um, sort of the main, the major. He also dealt with Washington a lot. Okay. Mark Hopkins is again another big figure in California. It's famous Mark Hopkins Hotel uh, in San Francisco, which is at the top of the mark, a famous landmark in, in San Francisco, looking over the bay and all that. He was the he was the real he was a real managerial type. It's, he took care of the actual running of the, of the railroad. And Leland Stanford, another of course key figure, founder of Stanford University, and. Uh, he, was, he went into state politics. He was a governor. He became governor of, of, of California, made sure that the Central Pacific you know, is, is taken care of, to put it mildly. <clears throat> um, the, uh, when Stanford ran for governor, the story is, and I think there's no, no reason to doubt it, Phil Stanford, his brother, stood outside the polling place in San Francisco, Francisco scattering gold coins 
for the masses, <laughs> they went up to vote. Uh, right now, apparently, the vote, somebody is telling me what the vote in the Philippines is, current election, the, the, the running figure is 50 bucks a vote, which is enormous. Of course, this is, that's, that's about a monthly wage. Weekly wage or monthly wage? A little thing. Anyway, mostly, yeah. Big. And so, uh, several hundred, there's an equivalent of about, what is it, 500 bucks here or something? Something like that. More than that. Anyway, so, uh, scattering gold coins, which meant a lot then, and, uh, of course, you can say, since there was a secret ballot, there was, you know, no way of checking on it. On the other hand, you know, you got a lot of coinage, some gold coins in your pocket, you feel your, you know, Mr. Stanford is worth, <laughs> is worth your vote. <laughs> At any rate, the sort of stuff they did was that the, um, for example, the idea, they, they were going along the Sierras, and what happens in California is you're zipping along pretty nicely until suddenly you, you reach the high Sierra, the big mountains there, how do you get around them? Well, they had a, um, 40 miles north of this route, there was a 1% grade, in other words, across the mountain. Uh, right here, there's a 2% grade, which was much costlier, of course, much more difficult. And, uh, they figured, in any other, in a free market railroad, they would, they would have gone 40 miles, would have saved a lot of money by taking the 1% grade. Here, they said, the hell with it, we're getting paid per mile by the government, and we wanted money fast. You see, as you, keep, as you keep laying track, a certain number of miles, you get the money. They wanted the money, and so they, they went, they didn't care because their costs were recouped by the government. In other words, like a cost plus such operation. Who cares about the cost? They want the, they want the money fast. Uncle Sam is going to pay for the uh, for the cost. Let's do it. So, you, so as a result, you have situations like that. Um, <clears throat> another thing they did is they at one point they got the sac they got the they came to the route of the Sacramento Valley Railroad somewhere around here. It would have been simple to just just buy the the road the sh short railroad. Instead of that, they built another road right alongside it. What's the point? It was costlier. They didn't care. They, were getting, they wouldn't get subsidized, you see, if they bought the other railroad. The subsidies per mile of track. A construction company gets a subsidy. They don't get subsidized from the, from the government for buying something. So they, they said, what the hell? So what, you see how the market, e market efficiencies are being skewed by governmental, by governmental incentives. Where the incentive is not to be efficient, not to make profits or avoid losses. The incentive is to get the money from the government. And whatever conditions are laid down, that's what you do. As, as one guy put it, quote, it was cheaper to build at the government expense than to buy a railroad already existing. In other words, the, at your own expense. So this, let that be a lesson, <laughs> an analysis of contemporary past or whatever economic history. The estimated waste in this thing was about 75%. In other words, the estimates are the cost of the track and laying it and so forth is about 75% high, higher than it should have been if they had really done this on free market incentives, <clears throat> if the government weren't paying for it. <clears throat> Uh, as far as the Central Pacific goes, also, the great story here. In order to get his, this country, in order to get this money from the government, Carlos P. Huntington goes to Washington, takes a train or whatever. Uh, I guess I, I, I don't know which, I don't know how he gets there. Anyway, gets to Washington. He takes a bag with him of $200,000 in cash. You have to realize, $200,000 in those days was enormous. I mean, it's the equivalent, I don't know what equivalent is now, but maybe $20 million or something. Okay? And, well, nobody knows how he spent it. All they know is after lobbying and seeing big shots in Washington, he left with a bag empty. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and he was a gambling type. And so that's it. So number two, he disposed of $200,000 of hard cash uh, to, the, to politicians to get this, get this deal. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, later on, as I say, they bought Southern Pacific. They changed the name to Southern Pacific. And Southern Pacific, which was then the combined... Um, I guess they connected up, uh, really ran California politics for a long, long time, decades, virtually. The California is essentially a Southern, in many ways, a Southern Pacific state. Um, okay, Northern, as far as Northern Pacific goes, that, was, that uh, had several entrepreneurs and finally gets into their hands by 1869 of the fabulous Jay Cook. We've already talked about Jay Cook as a making millions out of the Civil War through the, his bond deals, being a monopoly underwriter of government bonds, which he still was now, after the war is over, and also by setting up a bank and you know, a national banking system which requires pyramiding credit on top of government bonds, so the banks have to buy bonds from Cook, 
Anyway, he's in great shape. Anyway, he gets control of the Northern Pacific by 1869, and he starts running that. Uh, Jay Cook, by the way, was known as a tycoon in those days. I think the first guy that used the word tycoon was applied to. Everybody had an epithet. Uh, sort of the way that people worked in those that period. That was his epithet. He was a tycoon. <coughs> Um, and what he did was he started selling because he had his own construction company and stuff he started to sell bonds to his to, uh, to push northern pacific also to try to get people to settle there this is, you know this I mean this, this area is bad enough to schlep up here and this, this whole northern area it's cold and it's miserable and all that he's trying to get people to settle in this rotten area so he hires a whole bunch of propagandists. He used the same techniques that he, wrote, that he, did, he, he used when he was selling government bonds. Hire a whole bunch of pamphleteers to write about how wonderful it is and send it distributed in Europe and whatever. He, um, he had, for example, a guy named Sam Wilkerson who wrote a, a bunch of pamphlets, hopped up pamphlets about the glories of this area. And he said, <clears throat> I think one of, one, of the, one of the phrases was that the climate... The climate is like Paris in April. This is the climate of Wyoming and North Dakota and all that. Tell them anything. Tell the suckers anything. Get them up there. You see why the farmers are all irritated and they uh, they finally schlep up there and they find it's a little bit different, <laughs> a different situation. Uh, so Northern Pacific had another take. They had big shot stockholders who were granted stock freely. Uh, construction company uh, vice president Skylar Colfax, the Rutherford Hayes, who was later president. Secretary of the Treasury. And of course, they had um, Chief Justice Salmon Chase. Oh, by the way, before I get to him, they also had Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, who was probably the most distinguished minister in the United States, a New York Protestant minister. Actually, he came from Brooklyn. And he was on the take. He was on, paid by the Northern Pacific to, uh, to talk about the glories of the Northwest and all that. Be sure to schlep out the Northwest and settle there and things like that. Write pamphlets. <coughs> um, they had propaganda meetings for the area and things like that. Uh, Chief Justice, who's now Chief Justice of the United States, Salmon P. Chase, and uh, not only is he still on the take from Northern Pacific, but he um, he wants he wants Jay Cook. He comes to Cook and he urges Cook. Remember, Cook has financed Chase's whole career virtually. He, he comes to Cook privately. He says, "Make me a secret partner of, of, of uh, Cook and Company, which is a big investment bank." It's not supposed to be done with your Supreme Court justice. It's supposed to be a little bit above the back. <laughs> I mean, it's supposed to be a, a secret partner of some damn investment bank, which is running half the country anyway. So Cook, Cook says, so Chase, I mean, Cook says, nah, it's, it's too risky. But he's a very greedy guy, Chase, let's face it. His, his, his uh, appetite was enormous. <clears throat> uh, but he was also a secret uh, stockholder of, of Northern Pacific. <clears throat> and um, in addition to that, Chief Justice Chase, this private secretary, President Grant, was on the team. He was also a secret stockholder of Northern Pacific, General, General Porter, General Horace Porter. Uh, the um, <clears throat> Speaker Blaine was giving me some trouble. I told you about Blaine, this kind of a liar in the state of Maine. He was, a, he was on the payroll of the Southern Pacific. He was on the take. So he was giving the Northern Pacific some trouble in getting their stuff. So, so finally, Cook's brother, J. Cook's brother, Henry, was a journalist and a big time, full time aide, of, a long time aide of Secretary Ch of Chief Justice Chase at this point, like, uh, uh, and a friend of President Grant goes to Grant and he, and he, uh, Grant, and he convinces Grant. Grant is very, favor very much a favor of Northern Pacific, and so um, he gets Grant to be a favor of Northern Pacific. And then when, what uh, Jay Cook does, he, he gives. In order to buy the favor of Speaker Blaine, he gives him a long term, a very big long term loan. Long term loan, low interest. <laughs> now, a quote loan, unquote. That takes care of Blaine's stubborn opposition, <laughs> Southern Pacific board opposition. They say in politics, by the way, a friend of mine is, well, I mean, one of the big things, by the way, in politics now, and in crooked politics now, and local politics, is the, is the cable, the cable stuff. Uh, you know, of course, the Brooklyn, I don't think Brooklyn still hasn't got cable. It's outrageous. Uh, what happens is, uh, the reason why most many cities still don't have cable is that they're fighting over who gets the local monopoly, monopoly franchise. Instead of permitting free competition, each one is fighting for the monopoly. And my friend who lives in Tucson, Arizona, is a, a big observer of local politics. So they finally, cable was going to come to Tucson. There were two cable companies were fighting for the, for the, for the monopoly franchise. Okay? 
very, a very lucrative monopoly. So a couple of city councilmen, city councilmen take a vote, a couple of city councilmen asked and pleaded for a secret, <laughs> a secret ballot to which, which company should get it. And they said, this is an outrageous secret ballot. The reason why they want a secret ballot, they were on the take from both companies. They didn't want to be found out by either one. And so uh, they were in, in very embarrassed when the vote was public. And they had a, they had a vote one way or the other. <clears throat> so, uh, which is, which is def- one of the definitions of honest, of honest politician. I think this is a George Washington Plunkett, the famous old Tammany leader. The definition of an honest politician is one who stays bought. <laughs> So <laughs> if you make your, your contract <laughs> the briber, you stick to it. <laughs> if you don't stay bored, then you're in big then in politics, you're usually in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the uh, now Jay Cook and Company, the uh, here's Jay Cook owning the Northern Pacific and all that as a major leader. Jay Cook and Company gets, of course, from the Northern Pacific. The fiscal agency, in other words, it gets the power, the sole power to underwrite bonds and stocks uh, issued by Northern Pacific. It charges a 12, they charge a 12% commission, which is about double the usual commission. So here's the one example where Cook fleeces the fellow stockholders. You get, you're, you're an investment banker for your own railroad, except you own most of your bank, but you only own a small portion of your railroad. If you can fleece the bank, you're shifting funds quietly but illegally from, <laughs> from the your fellow stockholders, your comrades, <laughs> stockholders and bondholders, to your, yourself and a couple of other guys in the bank. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so Cook put on, as I said, a big propaganda campaign. First of all, to buy Northern Pacific bonds. Second of all, to, to, to settle in, in, in north, the northwest of the United States. And he had traveling agents and, and so forth and so on. Um, one of the traveling agents whom he brought over for this thing later becomes president of Northern Pacific. Uh, it was a German, fairly wealthy German uh, named Henry Ballard who comes over and uh, later becomes, I say, president. Um, <coughs> anyway, as, as, well, okay. The, um, J. Cook and Company, and it, it, it doesn't always happen, in fact, it very rarely happens in history where justice triumphs. Now, it's pretty rare. The case of Jay Cook, however, just as triumph, and I'm happy to record that. Show that life can be be- life can be beautiful <laughs> sometimes. Here's Jay Cook, the, the the monopoly underwriter, multi-millionaire, the tycoon, owner of Northern Pacific, uh, creator of the national banking system, the top investment investment banker, and so forth and so on. Uh, he's of course his headquarters in Philadelphia. Uh, Jay Cook. Goes bluey. He does it because Northern Pacific is now beginning to collapse, and he's he's getting loans out. It's, it's overextended. All these railroads are very inefficient. You have to realize they'll run badly, but nobody cared about how they were running. They just want to fleece it as, as much as possible. And that, from an engineering point of view, they're all in terrible shape. From an entrepreneurial point of view, they're in terrible shape. So here's Cook trying to get loans, and bingo comes the Panic of 1873, and. Uh, which was much of which was brought about by Cook's own inflationary manipulation through the through the banks and the government bonds, etc. Cook goes bankrupt. It's one of the great pieces of poetic justice ever. Uh, bank, go, going bankrupt at your own creation, more or less. In other words, here he is. He's responsible for Northern Pacific's overextension. He's responsible for the inflationary boom of the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, he's responsible for the big public debt, which comes in and the whole bank credit expansion. And when the collapse comes, as it always does come. He gets it in the neck. It was the end of Jay Cook. The fall of the House of Cook, as it was called. Um, the um, and, he, and he sets up these lying pamphlets about how great the great uh, climate is in the Northwest. All the rest of it, he finally gets it. <clears throat> uh, what happens is one of the he gets it because and, and who replaces? Well, what happens is he's of course the Republican. Uh, very wrapped up with the Republican Party, very wrapped up with Chase, with, uh, with Sam and P. Chase, with, with the Grant Lincoln administration and the Grant administration. And um, when he falls, he's toppled. His, his uh, place is now taken in investment banking by a firm, another Philadelphia firm called Drexel Morgan and Company. And uh, this is the beginning of the famous rise of J.P. Morgan, fame and fortune. <coughs> Uh, Anthony Drexel was a famous Philadelphia 
banking, uh, financial and banking industry uh, family, the Vexel Biddle family, which is still around, the Biddles are still functioning. Yeah, the same stuff, right. Uh, Morgan was the son of a British banker, and, uh, and Junius Morgan, uh, Morgan was younger, than I think, than Vexel, and very soon took over. He was obviously a dominant force. And finally winds up as J.P. Morgan and Company. But anyway, this is the, this is the result of this: is the rise of J.P. Morgan, who becomes a dominant figure in American politics, also as we'll see later. And uh, from 1873 on, in other words, there's the, the, the Panic of 1873 and the collapse of Cook that allows room for new, some new new faces, so to speak, in the situation. Morgan is essentially a Democrat, was involved with the Democratic Party, uh, although he became also prominent. In the New England wing of the Republican Party, we'll, we'll see later on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so all these, uh, Villard, after, after Cook goes bankrupt, uh, Villard becomes head of the Northern Pacific and tries to, tries to run it. Um, and doesn't do very well. It's finally, again, the costs are excessive and so forth. By this time, by 1873, with 1872, 1873, is the end of the railroad land grants. I mean, that's it. With the end of the Grant administration, with a panic, the, the massive land grants are over. So now the Northern Pacific has to sort of make it on its own and it couldn't do it. And it goes bankrupt around the late 70s. <clears throat> um, and, you know, it goes into bankruptcy. Of course, it's Bankruptcy in the States of Railroad doesn't mean the whole track is destroyed. It means the whole reorganization and whatever. Uh, coming in, the last transcontinental railroad to make it, doing it purely with, almost without any government subsidy at all, certainly with no grants, no loans, or all the rest of it, a uh, really heroic action. Uh, this was the so-called Great Northern, which, was, which started up in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, Way up in northern Minnesota, and skirted the Canadian border. Uh, sometimes on the American side, sometimes on the Canadian side, something like that. And comes into Seattle. And notice all these, even though there are only a few transcontinental railroads, they all compete with each other. If you're going to send shipments out the Cal to the west coast or over to the east, you can take any one of these routes. And so they're all in, really in competition. So of course, this, this is called the Great Northern. The Great Northern is completed around. 1870s, I believe, and it was, of course, mostly in competition with, with Northern Pacific. Uh, and this was organized and by an entrepreneur with James J. Hill, the last of the great railroad magnates. Uh, Hill is a very interesting character. He's one of these people who, who fit the complete Horatio Alger picture, uh, which is the so called stereotype, Horatio Alger stereotype. He, um, <clears throat> he was born in Canada, poor. He was born in a log cabin. He was actually born in a log cabin, which is not something, even though it sounds great, it's not something to, to really hope that you're born in. He kind of came from a, a Scotch-Irish farm in Ontario. Uh, he was, uh, became a clerk. He's uneducated. Comes to, most of these people are uneducated. He, he becomes a clerk. Goes to, he comes to the age of 18, emigrates to St. Paul, Minnesota, and um, becomes, he starts uh, getting interested in he starts buying out small bankrupt railroads and starts integrating them and making them more efficient. He's an extremely efficient construction person. Uh, and uh, he was also, uh, he, he started his first railroad called the St. Paul, Minnesota, Manitoba Railroad, a small railroad. He, he, and he, what, he, what he went for, I think he was also short and thin. A lot of these guys are quite short, otherwise, oh, these big entrepreneurs then. Uh, John Rockefeller is quite very short. Um, the um, I, I mention that because there are not too many short entrepreneurs these days. They were short. At any rate, the um, he, he and he specializes in low and low and low rates, cheap freight rates. Of course, freight is a big thing. The passengers are, from an economic point of view, didn't mean much for these companies, and a large volume and being competitive. And so he's very efficient. He's a very efficient railroad. It's always out-competed North Pacific. It made good profits. It was extremely, there, was no, there was no phony construction company. The whole thing was on the up and up. It's kind of a heroic thing, James J. Hill. And so I, 
Uh, it's, a, it's a good counter image. And he, um, and by the way, when he, uh, he encouraged immigration, but he was there, he knew, he knew the area. He raised wheat in this area in Manitoba. He knew exactly, you know, what the climate was like. So he didn't have to lie to the public because he was actually there. None of these guys, these pamphleteers are somewhere sitting in Philadelphia. They didn't know what's going on in the Northwest. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and we'll be back with. Let's turn the, turn the stuff off. Okay, the anti-monopoly movement, at least the late 60s and early 70s, focused on, the, on these problems with land grants and the land and called for um, the, the later movement, 1880s, we're talking about railroad rates, which were not really a problem. But the, this one zeroed in on things like demanding no future land grants for the railroads, which they accomplished in 1873, uh, demanding forfeiture of the un the unused land grants. Now, a lot of these land grants are simply there, unused yet, waiting for a price to get higher, demanding they be forfeited, and demanding also a taxation of the, of the railroad lands and a, and a forced sale of them. Uh, those weren't really accomplished so much, but at least they ended the, uh, the uh, new land grants. <clears throat> the, another, some other kind of a, another, another uh, large Racket that occurred in this whole period was what, what happened Indian lands. See, lands are supposed to be homesteaded, except they have this maximum size, as I said, was 160 acres. But any lands that the Indians got kicked out of was sort of up for grabs. There's no homesteading applied to it. There's a lot of finagling going on with taking them and selling them to speculate, huge blocks to speculators or to railroads. So railroads got a lot of uh, extra land that way. One of the um, Famous examples of that was the, uh, the Cherokee tract in southeastern Kansas, like a whole quarter here or something almost, in southeastern Kansas. The Cherokees were kicked out. The, the land that gets opened up, what's going to happen to it? And uh, it was sold by the federal government in 1868 to um, for for. Uh, to a guy named James F. Joy, who was also known as the Railroad King, at least in, uh, in Iowa, Illinois, Iowa, and now Kansas. Okay. James Joy <coughs> was the head of the Kansas City Fort Scott and Gulf Railroad. It was sold to him for, um, by the way, there were settlers there. I should mention this. A whole bunch of settlers on this land. They were disregarded. The whole thing was sold to Joy, and this is a little bit like the South American or Asian case where people are living there and they're, they're forming the land and all of a sudden this guy's now the owner. And uh, it sold to him very cheaply and uh, he, he takes, I think it sold to him for a dollar an acre and then he resells it for about two dollars an acre to settlers. So he's getting a big profit on no investment, or almost no investment. Uh, uh, the reason why he got this big deal, Senator uh, James Joy, is he was, it was, the land was sold to him by the Secretary of the Interior. The Secretary of the Interior, of course, was in charge of the public domain. It still is. So it was a powerful position. In those days, of course, it meant running the whole West. And uh, Secretary of the Interior then allows this deal to take place with Jim Joy. Who was the Secretary of the Interior? And we know the name of the Secretary of the Interior, Orville Browning of Illinois. All right. But most historians stop there. Many historians they just say, well, all right, Senator Browning, and I mean, Secretary Browning. And... But it also so happens that Browning was a brother in law of Jim Joy. All right? Now it begins, even, the light becomes even clearer <laughs> as to why this occurred. <laughs> um, he also, Browning, rep had represented, before he became Secretary of the Interior, and after he left the Secretary of the Interior ship, he represented Joy as his lawyer. So we have a very close relationship between Jim Joy and, and the type, the, the Railroad King, as he was called, and Browning. Railroad King. <laughs> um, the, um, another similar situation happened to um, another part of Kansas, the Osage tribe land. That was a lot, about eight million acres. For continuing with railroads, I just want to mention, talk a little bit about the land situation, uh, land question. The um, <clears throat> Frederick Jackson Turner, 
of a famous thesis around 1900 or so called the Turner Thesis about the importance of the frontier in American history, you know, the land question of the frontier, the fact that there's always a frontier out there. And uh, there's been a lot of arguments back and forth about it. Basically, it has a, a great deal of sense to it. Um, the, uh, one, one fact is that the frontier provided what's called a safety valve. In other words, people didn't like it in the east. They nipped out west to find fame and fortune and all that sort of thing. And uh, so what you have is an enormous expanse of free land, or more or less free land, once you get there and so forth. I mean, there's, 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 of course, there's differences on that. And lots of land available. And this is, uh, is extremely important in American history. It distinguishes America from, uh, say, Europe and many other, most other areas. Namely, there's an enormous amount of land and enormous ratio of land to labor. So, um, the, um, so if you have a huge amount of land per labor, per, per labor, then you have difference, all sorts of difference, economic, sociological, whatever, in production. For example, the kind of agriculture we have in the United States is very different from, say, in Europe. Because you don't try to, I mean, at least until recently, certainly during the 19th century, the idea, you don't try to economize on land. There's lots of land. There's land going out, coming out the yang-yang, as my mother in law used to say. Lots of land. There's, there's not, not enough people to till it. In other words, people become very expensive. Labor is scarce, scarcer, uh, and land is very abundant. So the kind of farming methods are those which are which are determined by that kind of situation. In other words, you have you economize on land, on, on labor and not on land. You use lots of land because land is not very scarce. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so the land labor ratio is very high. Now, the, on the other hand, in Europe, you ever been to Western Europe, for example? Everything is till, it's intensive agriculture. There's very little land per, per, per person, lots of people and very little land. So the land labor ratio is, is very low in Europe. <clears throat> as a result, uh, so Europe, European agriculture is not as intensive. In other words, the, the uh, very careful cultivation of every, every square foot practically is cultivated. Matter of fact, it's very charming. If you go, you go to the Alps, you're up in the highest regions of the Alps almost, and there's up there, and there's lots of cows, and there's cows with bells on them, and that kind of thing like that. Cabins and things going on. There's lots of people, and lots of telling. I think I find it very charming. You go to the Rockies or whatever, of course, there's nobody there. Uh, no people, no nothing, no cultivation. So what you have is, is no extensive cultivation in the United States. In other words, lots of land, and therefore there's, there's no intensive methods. Uh, so European agriculturalists would come to the United States and say the ter terrible the technology here, the agriculture is very backward. But it wasn't that it was backward. It's not as if Americans didn't know about intensive agriculture. This was, no, it was not economically unnecessary to have intensive agriculture. You don't have to worry about land. What you worry about is labor. So that this determines very different kinds of methods, technological methods in, 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 in agriculture. It, was it would have been ridiculous to have intensive agriculture in the United States when there's plenty of land around. There's no, very few people and plenty of land. You have a very different kind of agriculture. Okay? Extensive agriculture. You don't try to farm every square foot, things like that. <clears throat> so it all depends what you've got, what your resources you've got, and the responses is accordingly. <clears throat> um, the... Um, <clears throat> I don't know, by the way, and in, there's, a whole, there's still a lot of argument. I know very little about Indian agriculture. There's still a lot of argument about Indian agriculture. There's, there's one set of economists who claim that Indian agriculture is uneconomic because of the, the cow is sacred and therefore cows are never killed. On the other hand, there's another contending group which claims that uh, cows have an important agricultural function. It's not economically uh, weak or whatever. So that, I don't want to get into this argument because I know very little about it. I just, there's a contending, you know, there's, there's, it's not obvious, okay, I'll put it that way. Um, the um, so another thing is that the uh, of course it becomes a little more intensive now, but even 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 in this situation, even later on, you still have a much more extensive agriculture in the United States. Also, the kinds of sociologically different. In other words, uh, usually European farming farmers are, are farmers are in villages. They're all located in villages. This is sort of a, as a model. They all live together. In other words, you have a, a, a village with lots of people in it. It's a farming village. And the farms are out here somewhere, either right behind your house or a couple of miles out. Everybody's got their plot. Okay? So, and then of course, there are commons and everything. But even with individual plots, 
they're, so everybody's sort of together here in the village, and they go out in the daytime and, and fall in and come back. Uh, in the United States, we have lots of land and very few people. The settlement patterns are very different. Everybody's, as you know, they have an isolated farm. You've got the family farm, it's out here. And you've got lots of land out there, and there's another farm way the hell out here. So it's much more in, lonely existence, or individualistic existence, sociologically, than in Europe. Uh, villages are just trading villages. You have a few people, you know, supermarkets, <laughs> or whatever, general stores. But every individual is, is physically, spatially, uh, widely, wide, wide apart. Uh, whereas in Europe, they're clustered together in, in, in the villi farming villages. <clears throat> Uh, I suppose you can say it makes more more individualistic. Uh, American farmers be more individualistic. I suppose that's true. <clears throat> um, so Turner talked about the individualism of the farmer, the frontier. Uh, talked about it being more democratic. I'm not so sure about that, but I know it's at least an aspect of it. Uh, another aspect he did not talk about because it was so ingrained in him, he didn't even think about it much. Although it's in there if you look at it. Namely, uh, the, most of these people were Yankees, as I pointed out, and they were all pietists, as in addition to being individualistic. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they were, most of them had come from New England, rural New England. They all wanted to outlaw liquor and crush Catholics and things like that, <laughs> including Turner. I like, think it was so ingrained as, a, as himself a lost pietist that he didn't, even, didn't think twice about it. <clears throat> So I think this is important. Also, it was a safety valve. People could get out if it's, if it's a depression or a recession in New York or Philadelphia. All right, the heck with it. You, you, you find a farm somewhere. And a lot of that was, was being done. <clears throat> in contrast to that, a lot of people didn't like the fact that people couldn't have a safety valve. So a lot of eastern landowners, let's say you're a fairly large landowner in Massachusetts or in the south. You don't want workers or farm workers, say, leaving and schlepping to Wisconsin and set up a farm. You want them working here so you can have a cheap labor supply. So a, this has always happened. The constant uh, in the Industrial Revolution in England, for example, the main opponents of the Industrial Revolution were the landlords. They didn't want their farm workers leaving the farm and going off to a factory somewhere. It means they haven't got the farm workers. It means they have to pay more for, uh, for for higher wages. And so they're constantly trying to cripple the development of every industry in, in England. The, the first status legislation, social, um, quote socialistic legislation, unquote, were put in essentially by Tory landlords who wanted to keep the farm workers on a farm. Damn it, they didn't want to have these available, have factories available to them so they can move. There's a similar sort of process here by Easterners and Southerners in particular. You want to limit land development in the West, keep out homesteaders, keep out settlements. They have to stay here and work. Uh, again, remember, labor is particularly scarce in, in, uh, in the United States. <clears throat> uh, I might have mentioned this before, but in the South, slavery in the South, slavery uh, was, was, uh, was uh, probably a such of a large-scale plantation um, uh, ownership development, and uh, they felt that the, 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 they weren't here on the plantation, they'd leave somewhere, which they undoubtedly would have. <clears throat> the, at any rate, this, this um, but in the, as I say, with the 1862, the Homesteading Act in 1862, <clears throat> you have a breakthrough in that, you have a, a move toward Western development, and even though in some cases it wasn't homesteading, it still was enough of a land distribution, the United States avoided the whole feudal land setup. As a matter of fact, Louis Hart's uh, wrote a, a historian at Harvard wrote a famous book in 1948, I think, called The Liberal Tradition. And basically what he said was the difference in the United States, the reason why the United States never had a Marxist party, never had a, always had a, was essentially a liberal capitalist, is because we avoided the whole feudal land setup. And I think that's probably true, and it's, 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 a, broad, it's a broad statement. <clears throat> um, in cases where we had a sort of a feudal land setup, interestingly enough, for example, when the United States conquered Mexico and grabbed the whole southwest <coughs> from Mexico, uh, there were a lot of Spanish land grants. And in uh, some cases, the Spanish land grants were usually seized by the U.S. government or California government, however it is. And, it's, and you get huge land mass and huge land uh, acreage. But they usually, again, washed out. They didn't stay there because they wanted to, there was nobody there. They wanted to settle it. They wanted to subdivide it and sell it. So eventually, it was, again, washed out. Fortunately, you didn't have this problem. There was one, one interesting thing is there were a lot of Spanish land grants which we decided to honor in Mexico and Texas, uh, Mexico, I think, Texas and Mexico, and the, uh, the United States grabbed it anyway, and uh, they still have the deeds there, the whole New Mexican rebellion movement, where the people have their, they, they have the deeds given to their ancestors. And here it is, and it's, I, I own 100 acres. Most of it is owned by the American Park Service. So, Forest Service. <clears throat> so that 
there's an obvious clash with the, the deeds are there and they, they're not being honored by the United States government. At any rate, um, but basically we have an alliance system which is more or less free and, and, and open. That's the result resulting from this uh, lack of a, of a fixed, of a tight feudal land system. <clears throat> in Utah, also particularly, the Mormons settled Utah uh, in a very homesteading fashion. So what you had in Utah was a, a developed with a, with a small farms and homesteading, homesteading kind of a situation. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I will get into the water thing, I think, at some point. It's a whole interesting area. The, I'll just touch on it here. Um, in Europe, of course, water is generally considered superabundant. Uh, there's no such thing as a water shortage in Holland or something like that. But they, they, in fact, they plenty of water to sort of use it to uh, have more landfill. <clears throat> so the European, the, the question is who owns water? Who owns what water? The, the way the common law developed in Europe <clears throat> is the so-called riparian system. All right. P-A-R-I-A-N where you have a river say, you own let's say you have a house or a, a land right on this river, you own this part of the river you own the, this chunk of the river extending into it, just because you happen to live next to it, that's the so called riparian scheme, obviously it's not a very good way of allocating river resources I mean it's, it's you can lock up this whole, this whole river thing, nobody worried about it, they didn't think about rivers being a scarce resource <clears throat> Uh, except when it comes to polluting, you know, upstream, polluting downstream, whatever. Aside from that, <clears throat> wasn't too much problem there. When you got in the same, the same law that applied to the eastern United States, you still have a riparian water system, but water ownership. I mean, meaning essentially you can't do much of anything. You have to have some way of getting around this. In the West, we always have a big water shortage, water scarcity. In the West, for example, it says river. You know, look at a map, it says river. There's nothing there. Just a dry, a dry depression. And the only couple of months a year to actually have water running through it. So as a result of this very different kind of water system they, they, they hit out there, they have they, they invented the so-called appropriations. They have a, a more or less a homesteading system in, in, in rivers. Uh, and it, worked, it worked pretty well. Unfortunately what happened was, it's not pure private ownership. What happened is if you don't use your 3%, let's say you have the first 3%, or the second 3% or whatever, if you don't use it, it reverts, the ownership reverts back to the state government which you can then hand it out in some other way. So as a result, you can't really sell your rights to it. It's not a full private property situation. Um, there's an approach toward it, but it really doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't meet the whole thing. As a result, it doesn't work too well, especially when you're trying to change uses. <clears throat> so that, for example, in California, the constant wars, of course, who gets, there's water in the Colorado River, which goes through Nevada and down to Arizona or something, and who gets it? So Los Angeles, of course, is built out of a desert. They need lots of water all the time. Shouldn't they get water? So Los Angeles is getting water from Northern California, from the Colorado River, and they're accused by the other guys of stealing their water. So constant, constant political fights. They wouldn't have to do that if, they, if you could, if you, let's say, if you own, if you own, you know, three percent down here, let's say, of the flow. You should be able to sell it to Los Angeles. Why not? You sell the rights to it. There'd be no problem. But you can't do it because you have, it reverts back to the Arizona government of the of the Northern California government. So it becomes a political football instead of simply a market phenomenon. There were, of course, attempts now to try to make it a full appropriation system with full rights to buy and sell. That would eliminate the whole water, most of the water crisis between different governments, different regions, etc., etc. As a matter of fact, right now, you have a series of fantastic multi-billion dollar boondoggles. They just completed the Central Arizona Project in, in Arizona, which takes water from the Colorado River and brings it to Southern Arizona. <coughs> It's cost of, I don't know, umpteen billion dollars to the taxpayer over many years. What they do is they, they send the water in here, then they, the water is, of course, extremely scarce, right? Instead of charging a high price, the market price of the farmers, they charge a very low price. They subsidize very cheap water, way below the price of the cost of the taxpayer, and they make the farmers use all of it. If you don't lose it, use it or lose it. So you, don't, you get this cheap, cheap water, except you have to use all of it. And when they encourage them to grow these crops, which they can't sell it except at a very low price. As a result, the government then buys the, pays the farmers not to produce it. It's an un unbelievable situation. They, they take wheat or something, or cotton, whatever they're growing there. They pay the farmers, they subsidize the farmers to buy the water at a very cheap rate. It encourages fantastic waste of the water at a cheap, cheap, cheap rate. Then, 
They grow the crops that they can't sell at a, at a high enough price, so the government buys it back or pays them more money not to grow the crops. So they pay them twice, once to, to, to irrigate the crops, and two, not to grow them. <laughs> of course, the farmers love it. The farmers are getting paid three ways, or two, at least two ways, <clears throat> paid to produce the stuff and then paid not to produce it, double. And of course, the government or agriculture department loves it. They're getting all these dams, the interior department, they're getting lots of people, lots of employees, they're getting building their empire, they're getting lots of money from the taxpayer. The only people who don't love it are the poor consumers and taxpayers. They're paying for the nose of this. <laughs> paying for, for scarce water, to waste scarce water, and then paying not to grow the crops, <laughs> which, which they're being subsidized to grow. Totally nuts out of the system. But it's not so nuts out from the point of view of the gov federal government and the point of view of the state governments are in on the take, or the, and the farmers. Those three groups love it. All right. The, the people who are against the farm, the well, taxpayer don't know much. The econ free market economists are against it, and the environmentalists are against it. <laughs> so you have a coalition, growing coalition in the West of free market economists and environmentalists. Of course, they say, Jesus, you're wasting the water, you're killing wildlife, or whatever it is. So you have a, uh, an interesting new coalition in these, in these groups here. Okay, we get, we'll, uh, I'll get back to water a little bit later on land, but the um, continue on with the railroads. <coughs> um, <coughs> The, uh, by the mid 1880s, we had every every large town in the United States had at least two railroads. Sometimes more than that. There were, for example, between St. Louis and Atlanta, there were 20 competing railroad routes. So lots of competition. Uh, don't forget, there were no roads. So um, after have to always understand that. <clears throat> Uh, and the railroad rates kept going down, as I said last time, all the time, constantly, especially in, in spurts. There'd be a big price war to go down, and, uh, and it'd, be, it'd stay fixed and it'd go down again. <clears throat> uh, there were there were the five so-called trunk lines. The trunk lines are the, the big five railroads which went from the eastern seaboard to Chicago, basically. And um, you had the Several of these transcontinental roads going from Chicago or Omaha or something to or to the west. And you had the basic lines going from the eastern seaboard of Chicago. You had uh, <clears throat> uh, B and O, Baltimore and Ohio, which went to from Baltimore to Chicago, and uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, which went from Philadelphia, New York Central, which went from New York up the Hudson, and uh, and th you know, there was also. The Erie Railroad, which, and there's also Grand Trunk, which went all the way up Canadian border, I think, to Boston. So, uh, and they were very fiercely competitive. You realize they compete, of course, even though they don't go to the same places, but they compete. Philadelphia merchants are competing with New York merchants and so forth for the Chicago market. So, uh, <clears throat> they were, and there, as we'll see, they were constantly trying to have cartels to try to stop this. Uh, one interesting thing is when they had a cartel, they were trying to figure out how to, how to price this thing. Each railroad was arguing from its own self-interest, of course. Well, what, what should pricing be based on? For example, <clears throat> uh, Baltimore, Ohio, and Pennsylvania have the shortest routes, the shortest mileage. So they claim you should, you should base rates on distance. Uh, those of us who have shorter roads should have a, charge a lower price. If you have a higher, longer road, you should charge a higher price. Obviously, they want to screw the competitors here. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> New York Central, which had a longer route, said, no, no, you should base pricing on the course of operation. It turned out that New York Central had easier grades, so that it was less costly to build the, the actual track. So, and they had denser traffic, so they had lower operating costs. <clears throat> so they were arguing for that. And of course, there's no way to resolve this argument except on the free market. You just charge whatever you get away with, and the competitors can let you get away with. If you're trying to have a cartel, these become very important, kind of figure out, well, geez, what, what should we base the pricing on? Well, there's no way, to, there's no rational way, quote unquote, to decide between this. And Grand Trunk, which is always on the edge of bankruptcy anyway, was the, most, the shakiest shape, and eventually did go bankrupt. They said you should only charge to cover operating costs. You shouldn't have to cover construction costs, as they obviously were, they could hardly cover anything. Anyway, there was a series of rate wars between these Grand Trunk lines in 1876, which, so the old rates fell. <coughs> um, which touched off by the completion of the Baltimore Ohio Railroad in 1874, which starts the, the big series of rate wars. <clears throat> and uh, so, for example, in 18, between 1876 and 77, 
uh, just in that one year, um, give you an idea. First class freight rates uh, from um, from the east of Chicago, uh, and there were several classes, a bunch of like four or five classes. So first class charged higher rates than the fourth class, let's say. Uh, excuse me, lower rates than fourth class. The, um, the first class freight rates were say fell from 75 cents a cent per cent of hundredth, hundredth weight, CWT, hundredth weight, uh, I guess per mile here. So 75 cents to a quarter. In other words, it fell by two thirds and it stayed there. It's not as if it was short run temporary. Big, big smash. The, um, the eastbound rate that was going from Chicago eastward fell from a dollar a hundred weight to 15 cents. So, and the passenger rates were cut in half. They didn't worry that much about passengers. The passengers are a very small amount of portion of the income, but that was cut in half too. By the way, one way that the railroads curried favor of the government, this is all through that, uh, railroads was a way to travel, and big shots of the government got free passes, railroad passes. If you're a senator or governor, whatever, you immediately you get an automatic pass, which which finds you to be more friendly, benevolent, <laughs> though the railroad gives you a pass. Um, <clears throat> So you had this uh, railroad system. I'll now, I'll now give you a, uh, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, first, cla first class is the highest rate, and then it got, got lower from then on. I'll give you, to give you more, uh, a, a broader view here, my freight rates. Um, take May, May 1865, and we're taking this whole period, and the end of 1888. <clears throat> Uh, and we have the freight rates from New York to Chicago, westbound freight rates from New York to Chicago. And um, this is a standard freight rate for different freight rates for different classes. First class, second class, third, and uh, fourth class. And uh, this is this is two dollars and fifteen cents. Of the, I guess per hundred hundred weight again went down to seventy five cents. Dollar uh, eighty went down to 60, 65 cents. Dollar um, six down to fifty cents. Ninety six cents went down to thirty five. And some this is a little bit overdrawn because prices went down during this period, so there's a deflation. But even with that, even correcting for that, it still was a big drop. And was it still a a huge drop in, in even in real freight rates, much less, much less money freight rates. Um, the, um, another thing they did as part of the competitive process, not only did they cut the freight rates, they also cut the classification. One way of competing, <clears throat> you keep the freight rates the same, but you, you declassify products. In other words, one way of competing was you, shift the, you keep the rates the same. My, my rates are the same, but something you move stuff from first class to second class, or from second to third. You lower the classification, you're really, of course, making it cheaper while the rates remain the same. <clears throat> it's like nowadays, we have, you quote, don't increase the income tax, but you have inflation, everybody's walking into a higher tax bracket, and you pay a bigger proportion. So you, you, you increase the income tax without saying you have a tax increase. By the way, the latest nonsense is just yesterday. This is totally also irrelevant to our course here. But it is, it is no, it isn't, because it, it is modern economic, American economic history. Uh, Reagan has always been saying he's not going to have any tax increase. Well, he's had, over the years, he's had a revenue enhancement. So it's a revenue enhancement, it's not a tax increase. Uh, he's had um, closing of the loopholes, doesn't call it a tax increase. And now he has something, he said, well, he's not going to increase taxes, he's just going to find new revenue sources. <laughs> now, you, you tell me what the difference is between a tax increase and finding a new revenue source. We're just tapping new revenue sources. That's not, that's not increasing tax. You keep your pledge not to increase taxes by calling it by saying it's not a tax rate, it's just been rhetoric. You do it in reality, you don't do it in rhetoric, you think you've accomplished something. All right, that's, uh, so, but in those days, things were going, getting cheaper all the time. And they're getting cheaper 
uh, officially and also unofficially by having lower classifications of, of freight. In addition to that, railroads are so competitive they would have special rates. <clears throat> In other words, you, you have as, as railroads, you have shippers. Everybody else is a shipper. If you weren't a railroad, you were shipping things. You were shipping freight. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and railroads are so anxious for shippers' business that they would have special rates or rebates from the official rate. Rebate, rebate meant a discount. <clears throat> you get my business, I'll give you a 10% cut off the list. See, in business, you don't want to cut the list. And if you cut the price of the list, it's a, it's a real commitment. It's a, it's a big open commitment. It means you have a list price, you're cutting whatever it is, Coca-Cola or whatever it is. You don't like that. You hate, like, you hate to cut the price. You hope that maybe it'll go up again soon. You hope you, so what you do is you cut, you have special discounts for cu customers, different kinds of customers, new customers, old customers, whatever. <clears throat> um, and when the, when the big, as we'll see later, when the big charge came that Standard Oil was having special rebates, it was one of the big, uh, quote, monopoly things about Standard Oil, special rebates from railroads for shipping and stuff. It's true they have special rebates, but everybody else has special rebates. All the other oil companies had rebates. Everybody had rebates. The whole world had rebates. The whole world lived off, so in other words, not only did the official rates go down, not only were, were classifications going down, but every shipper was getting a rebate. Some were getting more than others, some less than others. Every, every shipper was getting discounts. Um, there was a famous story, uh, George, Professor Stiegler, who later got a Nobel Prize in Economics, did a famous study of the, of the um, of the steel rail taper. For many years, econ economists claimed there was something very peculiar about steel rail prices. Say from 1900 to 1940, or whatever it is, for 40 years, steel rails remained fixed. And this is the price of steel rails. And they continue, they always were fixed, whether they have a boom or a depression or whatever. The price of steel rails were fixed. Many theories were invented to try to explain this. Why should prices be? It doesn't make any sense. We know the prices go up. The demand increases, we know they go down and supply increases. Why do prices remain fixed? Well, this is a crazy theory of a concoct that figure this out. Well, Stiegler pointed out, and has been pointed out for other things, before you try to explain a phenomenon, you have to really make sure the phenomenon exists. <laughs> right? Before you invent the theory to explain something, you have to be sure the thing, the thing actually exists. How do they know that steel rails are fixed in price? Because the list price remains the same. If you're, if you're an economist, economic historian, you're, not, you're lazy, you look at the list price and say, well, that's it. If you go out in the real world, however, very, almost none, none of these things were sold at list prices. The interest, the important thing is what, what, the price, what was the real price for real transactions. So somebody went, I think it was Stiegel went out and made a study of what, what actually the prices were over the years. It turned out nobody sold at list. If you had a boom period, it sold like 5% down from list, and a depression, it sold 30% down. So steel rail prices were fluctuating all the time. It just that they didn't weren't recorded in the in the books. I mean, in the official price books, price list books. So what you're trying to find out is what the actual price is. <clears throat> and as I say, this kind of list is a, is a time time honored method of of sale and business, <clears throat> especially in the business uncertain what's going to happen. And you figure, well, you'll, you'll give a discount. <clears throat> so. Uh, And remember that when you, in a cartel, the thing which breaks a cartel, as I mentioned last time, is secret price cutting, secret rebates. Uh, you're giving secret re rebates and you don't want your cartelists, your fellow cartelists, to find out you're, you're screwing them here. You're giving a secret, uh, un, uh, you're breaking your agreement by giving a special rebate off the list. But, but these things are not even it's secret, they were, they were done all the time. Um, in addition to competing by cutting rates, you have to realize the whole, the whole emphasis in these days, of course, the whole emphasis is. How do you have a hidden price increase? In those days, the emphasis would have a hidden price fall. Prices were falling all the time because there was, was tremendous competition, a tremendous increase in production. It was a wonderful time for the consumer to be alive. And, and um, so, uh, <clears throat> in addition to prices being cut, quality of service kept going up. They kept giving you extra deals. Uh, one thing which the railroads began to do is, for example, is give you special discounts if you fill up the railroad car. It's obvi obviously why. You have a railroad car. Um, there's obvious reasons for that. Uh, they try not to send the car out until it's fully loaded. And so, if you can have a shipment which fills up the whole car, you're in great shape. If, on the other hand, you only do have a third of the car, you have to wait until somebody else has stuff for the other two thirds. And so, they started charging lower rates if you can fill the car up. Raises nothing sinister about that. 
And uh, that's one reason why if you have a high quantity shipper, you can get a lower rate because you can fill a car up and get it out, get it out there. I mean, no, no railroad wants to have a car sitting around a lot. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's another thing. Discounts were given for that. So obviously, with Standard Oil, and we'll go get to Standard Oil later on, but when Standard Oil starts filling up lots, lots of cars with oil, they're obviously going to get a lower rate because they can guarantee a, a, a fully loaded car, <clears throat> railroad car. <clears throat> um, So, for example, uh, New York Central at one point had 6,000 rebates, 6,000 rebates to shippers, and it was called special contracts or special rates. Um, sometimes the railroads start paying for storage. And it's another thing: who pays for storage? The shipper pays, the railroad pay. Well, it's up to you know, it's a contractual situation. As the railroads are battling for business, they started taking over the storage fees. <coughs> um, so one way, of course, of ha having hidden increases, if you have government, say, regulation of rates, and you want to have an increase and they don't allow you an increase, it's reclassifying class rates upward. <laughs> you keep the same rate, that's later on, like the 20th century, and then you have, well, we, we have the same, we haven't raised our fares in 30 years, except for what used to be third class is now first class, buddy. Okay, that's one way of doing it, without doing it officially, without raising officially. But the 19th century is the other way around, it's cutting rates. <clears throat> Um, okay, so what you had then is the first big business was a highly competitive industry, and oh, another thing I should say is that the uh, I'm, I won't, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the uh, the South was always belly aching about this. Why were freight rates in Southern railroads higher than the Northern railroads? Always complaining about this. Thought it was something sinister, some plot against the South. It wasn't any plot at all. It was economically very easy to understand. First place, they had no, no through lines in the south. In other words, the railroads, railroad lines in the north were long through lines, um, either from the east of Chicago or on west, you know, transcontinental line, lines. The south had short railroads. They didn't have any trunk, real trunk lines. And actually, it was short railroad. They couldn't, they couldn't have big discounts. They had short routes. They had a, had a high fixed cost and a terminal cost, and therefore, they're going to have higher costs. They're going to have higher... And now they're going to have higher rates. Um, another thing about the South was they had a triangular pattern. They developed trade. They would get, they would buy food, let's say, or grain from the, the Midwest. They'd sell cotton to the East. Okay. As a result, the cars would be empty and both going, you know, going both ways here. We, the South would have nothing much to sell to the West. Railroad cars would be empty, and they wouldn't have much this way. So, in other words, they were half full. And so they couldn't get the quantity discount. They'd be, they'd be paying higher rates because they're because the, the cars were half empty, empty on the other route, empty on the way back. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it was. It was not a plot. <laughs> Good economic reasons for this. It wasn't quote discrimination unquote. Um, at any rate, in response, so we have then a very competitive railroad system, very productive, very competitive, even overbuilt in some cases. We have a tremendous drop in freight rates throughout. As a result of this, from the very beginning, starting in the late 1860s, uh, railroads were desperately attempting to have a cartel, trying to get a cartel, trying to raise their rates. And uh, since they were the first big business, they were the first cartelists. And uh, there's a great book on this by Coco, who wrote our, our book on Triumph Conservatives. You're interested in, in this area. It's called Railroads and Regulation. I don't think it's in, it might be in paperback even. Anyway, I recommend it for those of you who are interested in going into this. And um, he talks about this in, in detail. The railroads are desperately trying to form a cartel, headed by J.P. Morgan, who now becomes, after the early 70s, the top, and for even before that was important, the top railroad investment banker. And trying to form a cartel, cutting shipments, getting quotas, and raising the rate. They try to do it. Every one was a flopperoo. Every one of them flopperoo very quickly. I'll, I'll mention there's a couple of them, a couple of leading flopperoos here. They couldn't do it. They had internal price cutting and external new new sources of uh, new railroads coming in. Very simply, they try to have you know you set a freight rate between here and here. You have two or three railroads, and they fix the price and cut the shipment. A new railroad will come in and undercut them. That'd be the end of it. They have better equipment to be newer. So these two things would broke every every railroad cartel. By, by the way, in railroads cartels are called pools. Railroad pools, for some reason. Pooling their 
resources. Um, in one case, kind of charming, in some cases, one guy would own, let's say, the two railroads here. I think in one, one case we'll get to what happened. One guy would own both railroads. See, but the managers are different. The sales vice president of each railroad, they didn't want to keep the, they, 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 after all, if you're a sales manager, your whole life is, is based on how much you can sell. They just, they disobeyed the orders of the owner. They started undercutting the cartel in order to pick up more, more for their railroad, more business for their railroad. Charming. <laughs> Here they are. <laughs> Here one guy owns these two railroads. He orders them to cut the, keep the price up and cut the, cut the, the shipment. And they both violate it anyway. They both go ahead and they start giving discounts and pick up shipment. Each, each sales manager is his own thing. You know, that's his, that's his ego. His life is, is wrapped up in that. And he violated it anyway. So you had competition, even one guy owned both railroads. <clears throat> uh, okay, one, one charming case of this is, uh, in one case, one of the most important cartels is called the Iowa Pool. Um, there's a very good book on this by Julius Grodinsky called, called The Iowa Pool. One of the, our top, I guess is dead now, one of the top railroad historians. And, uh, <clears throat> The conditions for a cartel were great. I mean, if you're interested, if you're interested in having a cartel, it couldn't have been better than, than these, con these conditions. Because you, what you had was really three railroads competing for the, for the top Illinois Iowa business here. Um, so if you have, and two of them I think were owned by the one guy. Okay, I'll get to them. <clears throat> okay, and um, okay, this is Illinois here. This is Iowa. The important thing is to try to get to the ter eastern terminus of the Union Pacific in the Omaha. Uh, Omaha is up here. Okay, Omaha is a twin city with Council Bluffs, which is on the Iowa side of this thing. I think the terminus is in Council Bluffs. Okay. So the thing is. What the Iowa pool dealt with was the Chicago Omaha market, which becomes extremely important. I mean, he has a transcontinental railroad going west. You want to hook up with the eastern, all the eastern stuff coming to Chicago. So this is a, is a key in Chicago around here. So the point is, how do you get from Chicago to, to, to Council Bluffs? One way is one, there are three, basically three railroad routes. And one was this one. I guess this is sort of the shortest, coming like that. This is the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. The other one is sort of like this, coming up like that. This is the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific. This is the famous Rock Island line. It's a great folk song in that. You have the Rock Island line, you have the Chicago Northwestern. And another one called the Burlington, but some other one went like this. Um, so down like that. Burlington and Missouri. Which, uh, <clears throat> and Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, these two roads, went, this went up like this. Okay, so you had three alternative routes. You know, this one which hooks up here, and these two. So they figure if you have a cartel of these three routes, you can be in great shape. You can then you can not only not only raise the rates, you also raise the rates of the, to the Union Pacific. So you can screw Union Pacific in that sense. And here's Union Pacific with a, with a transcontinental railroad. You make them pay to transfer to the, to the Chicago route. If you raise the right rate and cut the shipment. That was the idea of the Iowa pool. Uh, now Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, and the Burlington, and Missouri, these two lines here, this thing here, was owned by our pal James Joy, the, uh, the, the railroad king. Remember the guy who got the Cherokee lands, and a big, from his brother in law, Secretary of the Interior. <laughs> and he was the owner of, this, of these two railroads here, this joint known as the Burlington System. Burlington System. Um, and this was, he was essentially invested in by the Boston capitalists, Boston group, the Forbes group. And uh, <clears throat> he also controlled a couple of other railroads in this area. And this is the Burlington system. 
um, the um, the Rock Island line was owned by John Tracy. Who also owned the um, Chicago Northwestern. There was one guy, John Tracy, essentially controlled or owned these top two. News here: Chicago Northwestern, Rock Island, and, John, and Jim Joy owned the Burlington system. So there's two people. They could just work out a cartel. You could think it'd be easy as pie. And um, that's what they did. They owned. They formed the pool. And um, let's see, I think in eight in um, 1870, I believe. And um, it lasted officially for about 15 years. Actually, it collapsed in, a, in, a, in not too many years, in a few years, by the late 70s. Uh, and let's say you think it'd be duck soup to uh, to do this. And uh, if there was cheating between these two. As I say, one of these is the sales vice president, sales managers would cut it anyway, even though John Tracy owned both of these roads because they had their there were all sorts of problems in that. They could never get there was there was cheating between the two. There was there was there was secret price cutting and all the rest of it. And um, and of course they kept asking for higher rates from Union Pacific to, to permit the, the the stuff to go on in Chicago or come in from Chicago. So finally, what happened uh, to, to cut this thing short? We have to leave in a minute. Um, is that it's kind of interesting. What essentially happened was that the Union Pacific got to, got together and decided to crush the cartelists here by creating their own new railroad system, by, by getting together a whole bunch of little railroads and, and a whole Altoona system, uh, Alton system, excuse me, coming from St. Louis, so like here, coming from about here, before you get to Omaha, and down around here and up from St. Louis, and up to Chicago. And uh, by, by forming this thing, either by creating a new railroad or buying old ones and merging it, the Union Pacific undercut the whole cartel. And this was exactly what they did, and they broke the whole thing. And it, was, it took them so about seven or eight years to do it. So in addition to the internal cheating with these, these two companies, two, three companies, two of which were owned by the same guy, eventually the Union Pacific simply created, got together a fourth system, created a fourth new system which began to butt the other three. That was the end of it. It was the, the end of the Chicago pool. It's kind of heroic. That's the market in action. When the, the free market is in action, even if you have a couple of roads, which seems to be in, in great shape to have a cartel, you can't really you can't really continue it for very long. Okay.